it has not provided benefits to consumers. We're not paying lower prices. We're not getting more nutritious crops. This is something that makes it easier for farmers to grow on a large scale. So if you don't like that, you're not going to like the products that have been developed through genetic engineering so far. But it's not all that they are potentially capable of doing. Now, that's not to say that's not without benefits. One of the things that industrial agriculture does very well is to produce food that's inexpensive. We, many of us in this room, may be fans of organic and local and sustainable agriculture, but the reality is that's still a minority of the way people shop. Only four, per, only, uh, uh, even though organic sales have boomed, only 4% of overall food and beverage sales are organic in the United States. 96% are conventional foods. Even less than that, less than 1% of U.S. cropland is set aside for certified organic cropland. The reality is 25% of all grocery sales go through Walmart. And that's because most people, most people are concerned about one thing when they go shopping for food, price. Not nutrition, not freshness, not locality, not sustainability, price. So that's the system we have. And I think biotechnology has evolved in part as a means of, of helping that system to continue to thrive. So, first of all, with genetically engineered food, uh, which is now we've got we've got corn, we've got soybeans, we've got canola. Um, these are now uh, mostly genetically engineered. Sugar beets are mostly gen genetically engineered, but not very much in terms of you know fruit uh, or or vegetables. Um, these products are fundamentally different from everything else we've eaten. Um, they involve transfers of genetic material that could never happen in nature. And so proponents of genetic engineering tend to say, well, you know, this is not a big deal. What's a little gene here or a little gene there? Um, but they make big differences to the plant. For example, as you saw, soybeans, uh, you used to put the chemical Roundup on them and the soybeans will all die. You introduce a few genes and all of a sudden you can put this chemical on the soybeans and it, and it survives just fine. Um, another, another thing that, that comes to mind is uh, chimpanzees are 99% the same genetics as humans and yet they're different. So, uh, genetically engineered food is fundamentally different. It also poses unique safety risks uh, that we believe should be addressed before any of these foods are allowed on the market. And they fall into basically three categories. Um, the first is toxins. A lot of plants contain natural toxins. Uh, the leaves of a tomato plant are not good to eat. Uh, the leaves of a potato. Um, the, the, the poisonous, the poisons, the toxins are expressed in the leaves, but not in the part we normally eat. If you start fooling around with the genetic programming, you could inadvertently cause toxin production in the part that you might eat. So that's something that has to be assessed for. Uh, nutrients, just in the same way that you can change the toxin profile, you could change the nutrient profile inadvertently. Um, a third area is allergens. Um, people learn to avoid allergens uh, if they have that kind of problem. But if you're doing genetic engineering, you could in inadvertently introduce an allergen from one plant where a person expects it, or animal, into another where they don't expect it. So that's another type of testing that needs to be done. So, given that we've got all these foods on the market, uh, wouldn't you think that such testing would be required? And after all, there's even an international protocol uh, by the UN Food Standards Agency, Codex, that developed a whole system for how to evaluate all these things. Well, the European Union has mandatory food safety evaluation, but the United States does not. Um, in fact, I, I brought with me the, the letter 
uh, that, that FDA typically says, companies are invited to come in for a voluntary consultation about their crops. And this is what they usually say when they say a food is approved. It meant that they went to FDA for a voluntary consultation. And at the end of the consultation, FDA writes them a letter that says, based on the safety and nutritional assessment that, in this case, I'm reading for one, uh, Bayer and MS have conducted, it is our understanding that Bayer and MS, Bayer and MS have concluded that food and foods derived from soybean event FG72, this is the one that, that is in this letter, are not materially different in composition, safety, and other relevant parameters from soybean-derived food and feed currently on the market, and the genetically engineered soybean event FG72 does not raise issues that would require pre-market or review by FDA. And then they conclude, we have no further questions. However, as you are aware, addressing Bayer, it is the continuing responsibility of Bayer and MS to ensure that food marketed by the firms are safe, wholesome, and in compliance with all applicable regulations. So we don't have government agency review. So into that situation comes the question of labeling. Now, we are ardent proponents of labeling and are working hard for labeling laws right now um, for several reasons. Uh, one is simply what I started out with, that the genetically engineered food is different. So we think consumers have a right to choose. We label a lot of things. We label if food is frozen. We label if food comes from concentrate or not from concentrate. We label ingredients. If something is different, consumers have a right to know. Um, and the other major reason is this allergy issue, because even if they did test for the major allergens, they're never going to test for all the, the, um, the, the many things that a small percentage of the population is allergic to. I have a friend whose father is allergic to bananas. It's very unusual, but he has that severe response to bananas. Is FDA labels for one of two reasons. It's either a warning label on a, on a food or a drug to make sure that you use it safely, or it's a label to make sure that it's not misrepresented. You can't call margarine butter. Uh, so you have to lay, if it's something different than what you think it is, it has to be labeled that way. Uh, now, let me talk about that for a second, but there is a third kind of labeling, which is the labeling that helps define something so that we all know what it is. And it's a marketing standard like organic, the USDA defined organic standard. So let me go back first to FDA. FDA says from their perspective, genetically engineered food is exactly the same as conventional food. So there's no, they have no legal authority to require a warning label or a label to say, um, you have to disclose that this is genetically engineered because to, from their perspective, there's no difference. So if you start with that, if you start with that proposition that FDA does, there's no difference, they can't require labeling. With USDA, um, USDA has, as somebody said, we have lots of products that have all sorts of information on them from nutrition standards to it's frozen, it's taken from fresh. A lot of those are voluntary standards like the USDA organic standard. And these are things where producers have things in their products they wanna be able to talk about and these standards help them do that. Uh, what's happened with genetically engineered food is that, is that the manufacturers have done the same, we did surveys when I was at the Pew Initiative, people are scared by this label. So they're not going to voluntarily provide information that they think are gonna scare people off their product. So somebody's gonna to have to requ either require them to do that, or at some point they're gonna to have to make a decision that uh, it's, they're, they're just gonna to have to take the heat and label because right now everybody keeps saying the same thing. What are you hiding? Let me add one thing to this. Some of the problems that we face, whether it be risk assessment or labeling or whatever, come from a basic problem with how biotechnology is regulated in the United States. There is no Biotechnology Oversight Act. Um, going back to the mid-1980s, the Reagan administration decided that they would not push for that, but instead that we would have something that we call the Coordinated Framework, which basically extends the scope of existing laws to cover the products of biotechnology. So we have the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that covers animal products, and we have the Plant Variety Protection Act that 
covers certain sorts of GM plants. <coughs> and the uh, Plant Quarantine Act that covers other GM plants. It's awkward to try and oversee these things this way. And that's what gets at what Mike was saying. FDA doesn't have the authority to require it. Now, looking at will Congress ever get around to getting a scientifically defensible policy on this? Well, they can't pass a budget, so I'm not holding my breath. Just agree with what, what Eric said there, um, but I, I have to uh, uh, correct something that Mr. Rotemeyer said. Um, the labels, uh, some of those labels, like frozen and from concentrate or not from concentrate, are mandated by the Food and Drug Administration. They're considered, but it, it, this all turns on whether something is a material fact. Um, that's the language in the law. And uh, uh, FDA has interpreted that to mean um, it has organoleptic properties. That's their term. That means it has, it differs in terms of smell, taste, or mouth feel, or um, the uh, cooking properties. Um, but one, there's also a legal argument to be made that it's whatever is important to the consumer whatever the consumer cares about. And, and we think that, uh, that the differences between genetically engineered food and a non-genetic, similar, uh, same, you know, genetically engineered corn and non-genetically engineered corn are at least as different as frozen corn and not frozen corn, if not greater. Uh, and that uh, because consumers want it, the labeling should be required. Um, Poll after poll has shown that 90% of consumers want this. Why haven't we gotten it? We, we all, well, some of us uh, closely watched the ballot initiative in California uh, last November. And um, uh, it, initially it was leading um, when the industry came in with uh, a, a, an advertising budget that was uh, five times the budget of the proponents. Um, they managed to sow enough doubt so that it didn't pass. But it was still very close, 51 to 49. Uh, but it's hard to get these, law these laws passed because of the tremendous amount of leverage uh, uh, through, through money that the, uh, that the proponents of genetic engineering can bring to bear. Even though we, we all go to the stores and we see this, it says no GMOs or GMO free, that that's actually deceptive under FDA's guidelines. And the reason is that it implies that they are healthier or better than a non-GMO variety. And as I've said, if you, if you have FDA's position that there's no difference, then that's arguably deceptive. And the other problem is that even, um, even organic, organic means that you have not used seed that's genetically modified. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have some pollen from GM crops that have blown into your into your product. So even if you say no GMOs, you still may have a GMO uh, protein some some level in, in your product. The other problem is that Vermont, uh, when Monsanto introduced its recombinant bovine somatotrophin, that's the uh, the growth hormone to make to increase milk production in cows, Vermont passed a law that said we want milk producers to indicate on their milk whether or not that comes from cows that have been treated with RBST, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals struck that down as being unconstitutional, as an infringement on commercial speech, because essentially said there that there is, that simply wanting to know is not enough of a substantial state interest to require companies to disclose adverse information. Avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there have been a number of proposals for for figuring out ways to do labeling. I'm not sure how it work on nutrition because it's not gonna change the nutritional composition. And again, the issue there is nutrition, not process. If you wanna know the process, we've gotta figure out some other way to do that. Um, organic works because it's voluntary and people wanna show that they have, in fact, followed this process because people value that. They'll pay more money for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and. You can't guarantee, is it because of the pollen drift and stuff, but organic producers spend a lot of time sure. trying to do that, and many uh, organic companies, and you can sort of read what their policies are, do testing. 
to not only f follow the letter of the law, which is a process statement, but testing to see that you actually get the result that you're trying to do by following that process. And at this point, that's the only uh, labeling that you really are allowed to, even though some people are there thumbing their nose uh, at these laws and saying that no, no GMOs are in there. And you know, and it may well be that uh, Whole Foods being such a leader in this part of the market might uh, bring about a change that we haven't been able to do in the legal way. Right. There's no restriction on Whole Foods or a supermarket requiring it of their suppliers. So that could certainly be done. That's what happened in Europe. Mm -hmm. Long before the, the law passed, all the supermarkets said we're going to require labeling. As a result of that, nobody sells any, any food with GM labels because nobody wants to buy it. Mm -hmm. well, I would add the point that there will be products someday that have consumer benefits because of the GM modification. That will be a threshold day that some people will choose these things because they're nutritionally enhanced. And that will change the calculus of what you buy and don't buy. Um, and that's the way food has been regulated for many years. Food does not have to be approved by FDA before it can be sold uh, on the market as being safe. Um, this policy goes back to about 1992, Gene. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Um, prior to that time, there was some discussion within FDA about whether they have an alternative route. They could have chosen to regulate this as a food additive. And again, this gets kind of mind-boggling because the law gets kind of so confusing here. But a food additive, unlike food, actually has to be approved by FDA as being safe before it can be used. And there was some discussion that FDA could use that to regulate genetically engineered foods. Um, there apparently was a debate within FDA about that, but since 1992, the policy has been that, the presumption has been that genetically engineered foods are, are alike uh, conventional foods. They have left the door open. If somebody actually came in with a crop that was different enough, they could potentially regulate it as a food additive. But um, it's the FDA interpreting its authority. Well, and, and, and um, in the 90s, they actually at one point put out a, a proposal for public comment uh, asking on whether people, whether they thought there should be labeling. So, so they thought at least had enough basis of possibility to throw it out and say, hey, you know, should we do this? And they also made a proposal for pre-market notification. Um, and then it just, they never, they never moved forward on these. So, so obviously there's there's debate and and different ways of interpreting um, their authority within the agency. The sorts of research that we subsume under the title Greed Revolution, a lot of that was supported by large uh, philanthropic organizations, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. So far, because of these sorts of feelings of revulsion or just not wanting to get involved in something quite so long term or quite so controversial, the large foundations have mostly stayed out of this. There are some exceptions. I believe the Golden Rice was supported by foundations. Yeah. But there, there is ample scope for that sort of work to go forward. I'm in my late 50s. I hope that before I check out, I see some of that sort of work reach fruition in the developing world. But so far, your premise is on. Monsanto has done it to make money for Monsanto. They have deep pockets. They can push this far. That's not to say that others couldn't do it also. And, and at the root of that, is the issue of patenting of life forms. Mm -hmm. the, the decision that, that y you saw in the movie that the, the Chakabarty decision, which was the one which, which opened that door. Um, and and it's, a, it's a very, uh, there's a case before the Supreme Court uh, right now about um, uh, patents on breast cancer genes and uh, whether that should be possible. Uh, and I think that's a, a very important issue. We've gone very far in the direction of allowing uh, patenting of, of life forms and segments of life forms. And it, it opens the door to companies making a lot of money. And you sort of can't blame, that's what companies do. Um, you, you sort of can't blame them if we set up a system where they can, um, own uh, a type of seed, it works a little better, they sell it to people, and then because it's patentable, uh, they can't save it. You know, soybean farmers used to save seeds, now they can't save seeds because Monsanto will take them to court. So, 
Um, so, so it's a it, it, it's a, a question. I think from the consumer perspective, we feel that patenting has gone uh, significantly too far in terms of what you can patent uh, and and also sometimes what you can copyright. Um, those kinds of um, intellectual property restrictions are now not serving the purpose that they were supposed to, which was to foster innovation, but uh, the, on the contrary, uh, are getting in the way of innovation a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah and, um, and there's more under the surface. Many, many, I mean, you know, we say there are no vegetable crops that are patented. That, I mean, they're none commercially available. We were talking about hundreds of patents that have been issued for things that some people in the organic community believe are just descriptions of varieties that were available. Certainly one that uh, where the patent was not held was uh, a variety that had you know, been grown in Mexico for a long time. And so they're just out there patenting away, waiting for the opportunity for those things to be brought to market. And again, they, again, for the most part, are working on varieties that require this kind of uh, high input system, which, you know, when we're worrying about carbon sequestering and stuff like that, that kind of uh, agriculture isn't exactly what we need to uh, counter global warning, warming and, and stuff like this. So... You know, I, 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 I'm going to say, we, you know, if you're concerned about these, you can look at organizations like the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association and our lawsuit, support those, take the time to write that letter to your congressperson about when, when there's another bill that takes away your right to know about uh, things and, uh, you know, work with people in your communities who are trying to make information more open and research more uh, working toward the public good. Paul, one, one fact is that six companies own three quarters of all the patents issued for crops between 1982 and 2007. Scary. So one of the issues we haven't addressed is economic concentration here, which is that more and more power is being given in the hands of fewer and fewer companies, which means fewer choices for, for farmers, means fewer choices for consumers. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, six companies own 75%, I mean, three quarters of all the patents issued between, on crops between 1970, between 1982 and 2007. Mm -hmm. And when you combine that with Eric's point about, um, in the past, foundation support uh, promoting some of this uh, research, I think it raises the question of whether in some alternative universe right. there might be opportunities for public investment in this kind of research. Well, we also have, used to have a very vibrant public plant breeding uh, in every land-grant college in the country that, that mm -hmm. breeders would work with the local farmers to develop varieties. That's where a lot of your varieties yeah, are most, from. Most of the really good traditional varieties right. were either developed or improved in land-grant universities. Right. And those universities, there's still a lot of research there, but it's not owned by the university. It's not available to the public. It's owned by this private company that is uh, funding that research and making that information not available. I mean, that is the worst. I mean, in terms of, you know, people who are in the university system, one of the worst things about the current situation is that um, the results of this research uh, is not available to other researchers mm -hmm. to build on. I mean, that's how things have built up over the years.